Hi, this is Mrs. H and we're going to start on our nuclear unit. And in this nuclear unit, we're going to start with some of the basics here, um, starting with what is in a nucleus and what's not in the nucleus. And so from our study of the atom, we know that in a nucleus, um, we have two um, subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. Together in this chapter, we will collectively call those neutrons. What's not in the nucleus? Electrons. Electrons are attracted to the nucleus, um, but they are outside the nucleus, repelling one another, zipping around outside the nucleus. Okay, so getting into this nuclear unit, let's talk about things that you might recognize or observe and think might be nuclear. So things that are burning, exploding, oozing, or glowing, nuclear or not. All right. Um, so the answer is none of those. Those are all chemical reactions. Nuclear reactions are not going to be something that you would observe in your day-to-day -day life, um, except for maybe staring at the sun, which I don't advise you do. Okay, so why are nuclear chemical reactions so different? Um, we're going to start by taking a look at nuclear reactions and the energy associated with nuclear reactions. The energy associated with nuclear reactions comes from um, something entirely unique to nuclear reactions where mass is actually being converted to energy. Um, how do you convert mass to energy? Um, well, it turns out that when you rearrange protons and neutrons in a nucleus, that the masses of those rearranged protons and neutrons are not exactly the same there is a small amount of mass loss. We call that a mass defect. And so in nuclear transformation, such as radiation or radioactivity, fusion and fission, there will be a small amount of mass loss and that's converted to energy. Now if we go back up and take a look at Einstein's famous equation here, we see that that small amount of mass is multiplied by a very large number squared. And so it does not take much um, conversion of mass to create or generate a large amount of energy. All right, chemical reactions, on the other hand, um, those are going to be based on electrons being attracted to protons. And those electrons are electromagnetically uh, charged and attracted to the positive charged proton. And so if I have my chemical bonds forming, um, I have the energy here coming from breaking and forming bonds. And so if I break a bond, I'm moving apart and I'm doing work against that positive and negative attraction to one another, and I'm increasing potential energy. Uh, energy's off the screen there. And if I form a new bond, I have potential energy increasing or um, decreasing and being released to the surroundings. And that's what chemical reactions uh, have for their energy source. The energy is potential energy from electromagnetically moving those um, charges toward one another to form a bond and apart from one another as bonds break. And so therefore, it's a very different type of reaction than a nuclear reaction in which we're converting mass to energy. And the chemical reactions then have um, energy that is on a scale of a million times smaller than the large quantities generated in a nuclear reaction. All right, so there's Einstein and his equation. Okay, so in the nucleus, um, there are nuclei that are often unstable and some that are stable. And so as we look at the nucleus and we want to know what happens to cause nuclear changes um, and understand nuclear changes, that's kind of our first topic is that nuclear stability versus instability. And so right away, just from our knowledge of protons and knowing that protons are positive, um, all of these positive charges in my nucleus, all of these protons should be repelling one another. Remember that electromagnetically positives repel other positives. And so because these repel one another, the nucleus itself has some instability because of electromagnetic repulsion.
between those protons. And so what is actually helping the nucleus and holding it together is a question that we need to be able to answer in order to understand the nucleus a little bit more. And so let's talk about fundamental forces and then I'll come back to this page. All right, so there are four known fundamental forces in nature. One is gravitational attraction between masses. The next we've talked about as electromagnetic, positives attract negatives, and positives would repel other positives, or negatives would repel other negatives. So that's what we've talked about so far, is that there's an electromagnetic repulsion because these positives repel other positives. Remember that these neutrons are neutral and have no charge. Okay, so our other two fundamental forces are both nuclear forces. The fundamental force, uh, the strong force, is the force responsible for holding the nucleus together. It's named the strong force because in order to hold the nucleus together, it must overcome that positive, positive um, repulsion to one another, and so it must be a stronger force. Um, the other force, the weak force, is actually within the nucleus, but it's more involved with individual protons and neutrons and keeping those from um, decaying or splitting and some changing in some way. Okay, so what would help the nucleus become stable then? Um, we really have a very vaguely defined um, strong force holding the nucleus together stronger than this electromagnetic repulsion. Okay, so then can we predict which um, nuclei will be stable and can we affect the nuclear stability? And so um, here are some examples of ways that you might think you could affect nuclear stability. Well, would it be different if that uranium nucleus was in a compound or in a chemical or if it's just uranium by itself? And the answer is no. The extreme heat conditions, could I heat it? Could I take my atom to the sun and cause some extreme heat conditions? Um, and the answer is no. And can I put pressure, can I put a whole lot of force, external force um, on the nucleus and create some nuclear changes? And the answer is no. And so um, the answer here is no, we really can't do much to affect the nucleus. Um, heat, pressure, and even the presence in a chemical, the nucleus is a million times smaller than the atom. And so it's so much smaller and so tiny inside that atom that pressure and heat, movement of molecules, heat being um, the speed of molecules, remember from our thermal unit, um, and extreme pressure, that's going to be on the electromagnetic scale, putting pressure on those outer electrons that are pushing back. Um, and the nucleus isn't going to care if there are chemical bonds with electrons involved. And so none of these are going to be affecting the nucleus. So how do we know if a nucleus is stable or not? We use um, a graph that has been done and neutrons and protons are plotted on this graph. So I take a nucleus and I plot the number of protons that it has. And I know that because that's the type of atom that it is or the atomic number. So that's just coming straight off the periodic table. The number of neutrons I get from subtracting the mass. So I have a mass. I plot that neutron and proton. And so this graph is a little complicated. This graph shows a band of stability. And so what does that mean? That means this blue region on the graph, um, all of the stable nuclei appear in this region. And so if I have nuclei up here where I have um, essentially more neutrons, I have too many neutrons, then I will have an unstable nucleus, and there's a type of decay, beta decay, listed here for those type of atoms. If I have a nucleus that has too many protons, that would put me down here on the graph. I'd have more protons than I need, and that would be another type of emission or decay. If my nucleus is uh, over an atomic number or 83 protons, 
then it is always going to be radioactive because it is just too large for it to be stable and overcome all of those um, positives that need to repel one another. And so if I were to take from this graph and I wanted to predict, if I have a nucleus that has 40 protons and 40 neutrons, why well, that would put it about here on my graph it is not on the band of stability. And so I would predict that that nucleus is not stable. And I would in fact be able to say that it looks like that nucleus would undergo positron emission or electron capture um, in order to move itself towards that band of stability. If a nucleus is not stable, then it might undergo one of several types of radioactive decay. And those are gonna be shared in another video. Hope that you helped understand some of the nuclear forces and information here. Have a good day.